So I'm Peter Holford, I head up the data innovation team at WorldPay and uh, I'm just here to talk today about um, building teams who build data products. So I gather you've just been, those who have been upstairs have been treated to a world-class run through some incredible examples of what you can do with data science. Um, so uh, that sounds like it was pretty exceptional. And uh, from this side, um, when you go to, when companies actually go to commercialize their data, a lot of, um, a lot of what they need to think about is to uh, is, is building products and the product angles. This talk is just about um, the, the need for the product roles and input in commercializing data sets. So, oh, I think some folks come in. So, who knows who we are as well, Paige? Anybody who does know who we are and who doesn't know who we are? Okay, so roughly equal in the room. Um, so we are a very large um, payment acquirer. So um, we pick up the transactions from, um, from the chip and pin terminals, from online, and then we process those through via the payment schemes you would see as the logo on your cards and through to the issuing banks and then back and say your payment has been accepted or sometimes not. Um, so that's what we do. So we were originally part of RBS and then were bought out and made independent in 2010, and then we floated last October and went roughly in the middle of the FTSE 100. So we are uh, pretty international, as you'd expect from the name, so in over 140 countries, and we do almost half a trillion pounds worth of, uh, of spend each year goes through our, through our platform. So um, one of the biggest acquirers in the world. So as you can imagine, we, uh, we also have a lot of data flowing through um, every day or every second of every day and so we need to look at how we can make ourselves better as a company and also um, how we can provide value-added services. And uh, just a little note is, I know this is a software engineering conference and so I just want to let you know in advance, uh, full disclosure, if you like slides that look like this, then you might be a bit disappointed by this presentation because it's most about the, the, the activities, the product side and the human side. So um, if take a walk if you're very welcome, but if you want to take a walk and then uh, come back when there's some tech later, fine. But I just want to make sure people are cool. That was an awesome talk, by the way. I really enjoyed it. So anyway, data commercialization is kind of a hot topic. So people have talking about it for a, a long time. Um, big numbers banded around. So this is... Uh, strategy and so it was was originally PwC um, so a report from them saying that it's going to be worth 175 billion dollars back in 2013 I haven't seen a report that said whether it was worth 175 billion dollars in 2013 but I think generally accepted that this is an area that is growing and companies are looking at their data assets that they have and saying how can we drive additional value out of these both to our existing customers and also through new revenue streams and new business models so what that means is sometimes that, that turns into consulting, analytics, bespoke approaches, but often those who are doing it best look at it from more of a product angle and they look at the product that they can build from that. So it's worth a moment <coughs> excuse me, to talk about what we mean by data products. So when I talk about a data product, the obvious bit, so it's going to capture data, going to run logic, and it's going to deliver some output. It also needs to be scaled and repeatable and not manual. So this is something that actually, you know, it works. It can be just straight through processing. It's, it's, it, you can buy it and you can use it. You don't have to uh, set it up in, in a big way. It's not a project. It's not a, a one-off engagement. Ideally, so I think of it as being configurable as well. So not just a black box, but something you can actually, as the user or the customer of it, you actually have some input into how it works. And then I also consider it to be non-transactional. So I guess what I mean by that is I wouldn't consider digital banking to be a data product because it's largely a representation of the transactions that are occurring when you, when you go online. So I, I wouldn't consider that to be a data product. But some of the other products you see that help you track your spend, th those are. But to me, when the, when the actual action that results from the data happens elsewhere, then it, that makes it more of a data product. So my personal favorite example would be Fitbit. So this is a uh, this is a kind of a new take on how exercise works. So I know I am one of those people who doesn't go to the gym. I join, I have a goal, and then I don't go. 
because it's just too big a deal and I have lots of other things to do. And then Fitbit has been for me something that I've actually really taken to because it takes all of those big decisions and turns them into micro decisions. Have I walked enough steps today? Have I done enough? What can I do in the next hour? So to me, that, that is, um, that's something that I've found very, very usable. Who here has a Fitbit or a comparable product? Do you find the same? So to me, it's been pretty powerful. So what this really is, is data capture. So this thing on your wrist is capturing data that kind of, it already existed in the form of your actions, but it didn't actually exist as, as it wasn't captured in any form. So it's data capture, and then it's data presentation. That's, that's all, I mean, there's a ton of logic to constitute what, what is actually a step, what is a heartbeat from the signals it's picking up. But ultimately, this is about capturing data and then presenting it back to you in a form that allows you to take the decisions about what you can do in each hour. Same with City Mapper. So, City Mapper is kind of, I, I mean, I use this a lot. I don't use it in French, but my screenshots that I tried to take were not as good. So, Google helped me out with these ones. So, City Mapper is basically picking up where I am from my device, and it's picking up where I want to go from me or from its memory of where I like to go, and then asking me, is this where you want to go? And then it's giving me, once it's worked that out, it gives me some options. I can choose those options, I can configure those options. And then once I've selected one, it even tracks where I'm going and gives me route guidance. So well, I've been taking my oldest son to the school recently for an early morning club, and we've been on the bus. It even tracks how many stops and tells you when you need to get off, which is pretty good for someone like me who misses stops all the time. So I find that very powerful. And then there's Nest. So anybody have a Nest in their house or a Hive or an equivalent? So starting to break through, not as many as Fitbits, but broken seal in the room. I'm not allowed to buy one yet because it's not deemed quite um, quite essential enough in the house, so I'm a bit gutted about that, but anyway. So, um, so Nest is the same, so it's data capture, it's data presentation that allows you to make decisions about I should turn this thing off, this thing on, I should cut my, cut my data usage back. And it's also a call to action, so you've got here, you know, do you want to go on this, this particular journey of uh, advice and decisions you can make, which of course when it goes wrong, could lead to something like this. And my view is generally, if it gets to something like this, you've probably gone a little bit wrong. Um, especially, by the way, if you didn't even know they were doing this, and then it's the <coughs> how on earth did they know that moment. So uh, that brings us into the whole territory of creepy versus done right. And then another, another data product that's worthy of mention is Tinder. So um, it's actually pretty, to me, that's been pretty defining in terms of technology and what it does. So you've got uh, customer preference gatherings. I swipe right, I swipe left. It learns what I do and don't like. And then, of course, that's at an individual level learning. And back to our thing about data products, of course, the, uh, the transactions happen in a different domain to the app, but probably best leaving that point. And of course, there's some of the best known brands as well. So. Um, these are all ultimately um, data products. And I've included Amazon even though it sells stuff because they were quite defining in terms of the, the recommendations. The people who bought this also bought the, the stuff we all know and experience. So to me, that would, I would consider that a data product. And if we think about then companies that have created a data product out of their data assets, so um, you think of one that maybe took that and created a whole new product revenue stream and actually even created a whole new company out of that. That sounds like something quite up to date and new to have happened. But actually, there's one example that's one of my favorite that happened in 1970. So they created a data product back in 1970 to help them with a particular problem, which is for Great Universal, wanting to understand the risk they were taking by giving people credit for mail order goods. So effectively pay later activities, you send people things and then you you, you, know, you receive payments subsequently, so you want to understand a bit more about the profile. In 1980, it's offered as a service to, uh, to third parties, so anyone can then use this service for their own business. And then in 2006, that got spun out and floated as an independent company into the FTSE 100. Any takers? Anyone want to? It's Experian. So, to me, that when we talk about data commercialization and that kind of activity, this is one of the, the best examples. I mean, that's a company that solved a prob problem with data it had and built 
provide it as a service to others. And then it became a company that I think, I haven't checked today or recently, but I think is actually even bigger, and certainly has been at times bigger and more valuable than the original company, which is now Argos. So what are the key steps in that? So again, this is quite big blocks, but um, a lot of data, a lot of companies, when they approach um, building data teams, they focus a lot on the data science and analytics. And then the, uh, the better teams and the better practitioners are really, really embedded into the customer need as well. So I if that's an internal problem or that's somebody else's problem that I think I can solve with my data, they're kind of focused on that as well. And this whole thing works really well. What is often under-considered is then the usage or the applications. How do I actually embed that into somebody else's world? How do I drive a decision for them? How do I, um, now how, how do I, how do I put it in their hands? What will they do with it? So that I don't just give them a chart and a list of things and they have to go and start some projects in their own side and figure out how on earth to act on my advice, but how do I actually embed it or integrate it with them? So that comes down to the roles in the data teams. So as I said, a lot of companies, um, when they approach this, they think about very different roles. And to be clear, all of these roles are, if you don't have these people, you don't have a data team. So in no way should anybody think, oh, hey, I can just build it with product. Because you, you need all this stuff. So the data scientists, as you've just seen, the kind of stuff you can do, essential. <laughs> um, you've got the, the engineers getting it into order. You've got the governance. You've got the quality. So all of that, making sure it's all lineage, compliance, and, and uh, also analysts when you don't have data scientists, but you're your platforms are a bit more old school, then you need a lot more analysts as well. But typically the product role is not formally uh, or overtly considered when building out those teams. So taking our previous approach, what that can result in is something that is a narrower focus. So it really focuses on having established a concrete problem. It's how do we turn that into an abstract problem as quickly as we can? And then how do we use that to drive an abstract solution, which of course at some point has to become a concrete solution. So that's that sort of, it's a, it's a much narrower focus. To me, the product role within that focuses here. So it's helping define from the needs and way back from the, the needs, the important stuff about you know, how some, what, what, what someone's genuine problem is versus what we think, validating that through and helping and really bridging. So bridging that into what uh, what the, you know, the, the the data science and the others need is their abstracted problem with their data set. How do I? What's my goal? What's my challenge I'm solving? And then, ultimately, into from my solutions into a concrete solution. So the stuff you'll have heard upstairs, catching a serial killer, that's a pretty concrete solution to my prediction of where they might be. Um, but that could be, you know, through to with going back to Experian, the you know, do you do you accept or decline? What is the score? What you know? And a lot of those things are automated. So to me, that product role is, is two things. So it's a mindset and it's a skill set. So the mindset essentially, and I won't just read out everything that's here, but the mindset really is about the ability to take and hold the concrete problem and go back to that when needed throughout the journey of the, you know, all the data science, all the analysis, all the logic, all the testing, everything else. And then being able to focus on how it needs to be integrated and embedded at the end. So to me, that is, that is the, the steering. It's a, it's a kind of partnering and bridging role. And it's keeping that concrete problem and that concrete solution in mind as you go through the entire, the entire journey of your data science. But also the skill sets. Um, so I've said a bridging role, but it also involves um, capability in business model design. So you know, there's a whole, whole new business model needed often with this. And, uh, and then you need to be pretty up on design, on experience, on how people are actually going to be able to use your output. But that is not in any way to suggest that they shouldn't be highly data literate or tech literate. And, uh, and that's, I think that's an important thing. They should be very analytical tech literate people. This is not a, a fluffy role at the side. This is very much an embedded into the, the rigors of how you drive this stuff. So <coughs> what are the factors involved in, in uh, the importance of a product role over time. So I think as we go more towards machine learning and AI, to me that is that makes the real world problem I'm pointing at and how I how I deliver that even more important. Because I otherwise I, I have a black box that's gone and solved the wrong problem. Um, 
So the difference between a car that knows the best way to get to where I want to get to versus the car that has its own opinions about where it should go and where I should go, there's a whole other world of difference. So and that's a pretty obvious example, but that's, uh, you know, the, as, as these things rise, it becomes more important. Similarly with the, you know, with everything being connected. So as, as we get to more, uh, you know, things, connected things, things talking to each other, then um, actually a lot, of, a lot of products will become more automated and that requires a lot more scalability. There's whole levels of challenge to consider there. And then there's a lot of companies that are now taking their big data <coughs> platforms and they're going from very much at the side of the business as a proof of concept into actually the heart of their business. So as they, uh, as they, may, as they look for the value out of those investments, then they're looking more for the revenues that come with proper product design. And then the non-negotiable bit. So we talked about the ethics and should you ever experience something like that Google moment. But, uh, but there is also the, oh, sorry, the Nest moment <laughs> um, of the cartoon. But there is the, uh, the, the regulation and the legislation. So parking ethics, reputation, all that stuff and experience. There's also the non-negotiable bit of what you can even do, where you can reside the data, how you can handle it, what you can store, um, the permissions. So that stuff is, uh, yeah, that, that is not reducing. And then I think you're going to experience the convergence of digital and data teams as well. So more of this stuff becomes how I experience it, uh, how I embed it. Just as you know, we talk about the, uh, the more transactional products, a lot of those are going to be starting to leverage a lot more of the data, a lot more of the, uh, the connected activity going on. So let's look at a few people that I think, just an opinion, uh, doing this well. So I think there's the general one, which is the connected cast. This is no single body is doing this. This is a lot of people. There's a big, e there's kind of a theme emerging. But we think about those, this, this, this is a lot of data products being put into what has ultimately been a very passive and manual device up to now. So, um, so there's everything from you know, gathering the driving data to influence your insurance premium based on how you actually drive as well as what's happened in the event of an incident, through to where you are as a car in a connected city, um, through to then a lot of stuff around, you know, what you like to listen to and all that stuff. So there's a lot, everything that's going into the connected car has a lot more product activity into it that then is driving a lot of the, a lot of the data science and the data gathering that's needed. And getting a bit more into business models, so then there's, uh, this is quite old, so this has been around for a long time, but this is uh, Rolls-Royce with jet engines. So you, um, you want to buy a jet engine off Rolls-Royce, actually what they'll do is they'll rent you the dollars per hour used. So you're, they're charging for uptime and for usage rather than selling you this massive heavy thing that you screw onto the wing of your plane if you're an airline. Then everything as it's in the air and on the ground is monitored constantly in Derby. So they know, they know the usage, but they're also tracking what's going on with the engine. They're tracking the condition. So if there's a fault with the, uh, a fault with the engine, then the ground crews at the airport where the plane is arriving are ready. They know which problem they're going to fix. They don't have to waste time investigating. They know the components. They can be <coughs> completely ready with it all. And then the other thing is, so say there's a bird strike, you know, you're on the radio. I've hit a goose. When I land, can you check me out, please? Because it didn't sound nice. It sounded a bit ugly. Though they're going to have to have to check everything. They have to make sure the plane's okay. Well, now they don't. So there are examples where they've turned the plane around with normal time because they've been able to alert the ground crew that despite the bird strike, there was actually no damage to the jet engine. So that has become a massive time save and cost save for airlines, passengers, ground crews. So, um, so that has been very powerful. So when you look at, you go back to the results of this, actually they're making more money out of renting the engines than they were out of selling them. And that's to the same people. So how does it make sense to be renting an engine and for an airline be paying more in rent than I would be in buying? Well, there's the cash flow efficiency, which is a factor. But, but actually, if you consider what they've done is they've, they've looked at a lot of the consequential costs in an impact in the business of downtime in the jet engine and they've brought some of that benefit in so they can charge more because they save you money overall as an airline if you don't have to pay all of the staff re uh, compensate all your passengers 
um, pay the exorbitant landing fees. I'm sure I've not looked into it recently, but I'm sure they're not cheap uh, for, for staying longer at the airport, all that stuff. If you've saved those costs, then you're probably going to pay more to your engine supplier who's been able to save you that time and help you turn around more efficiently. Time wasted in diagnostics, all gone. So what they've been able to do with this business model is they've looked at what it's actually worth rather than necessarily what it's cost, and they've been able to charge more overall for the service than they were for the product. So to me, that's pretty powerful. And then all of these are in the public domain as well, so there's, uh, um, uh, please look into them more. So then Sky, so Sky, what Sky's doing is pretty amazing as well. So um, who here's a Sky customer? So uh, they know a lot about you from your usage of all the, d uh, the boxes and the apps and everything else. They know what you've seen, they know what you like to watch, they know what you've planned to watch, they know whether or not an advert was shown or not shown, they know if you skipped it. So what they were able to do with that behavioral data is they're able to then do media evaluation. So what was the true audience? So going from a small panel of surveyed people or people who have agreed to have a box in their home into a massive panel of empirical history of adverts that were shown or not shown, including to whom, with the demographics and the viewing preferences of those people. So not just that, but what they've started to do is they've gone beyond that. So with AdSmart, they're now in the... Uh, beginning of a shift towards selling audiences instead of time slots. So if you want to, if you use AdSmart, you don't have to say, I want to have a slot during Breaking Bad, and that kind of correlates to the sort of audience I want to capture, and I know there's some leakage to others. What I can actually buy from you is the audience of the people by demographic <laughs> and by lifestyle um, factors that I want the advert shown to, and it will go to those people, and it will not go to other people. And you can do it during any program. So any program during their owned channels. But that's a big shift, and that's a much greater level of efficiency. And this platform is available for SMEs to use as well. This is not just for big players. When you go look on their site, SMEs can use it. It, it actually democratizes the use of um, TV advertising a lot more. And then I absolutely love this guy, so hearing him talk. Um, Grimmer, he's thinking of the shoe. He's at Echo. He's thinking of the shoe as a platform. So if the shoe can be a platform, anything can be a platform, right? This is, this is going from, you know, think of it as, it's not just a, a passive product that I've sold to someone and then I hope they'll buy their next shoe from me or, and I probably, I don't even repair the shoe. Someone else repairs the shoe if it needs repairing, but I hope to sell them the next shoe. So he's gone beyond thinking, I'm going to enable it and gather some data and make it a smart product. He's even gone beyond, I'm going to then connect that and make it a smart connected. He's thinking of that as a platform. So how do I abstract from the shoe into the thing you do with the shoe? And how do I give you much more around that, of which the shoe is incidental? So I don't think that Echo are renting people's shoes and then taking them off and renting them to other people afterwards. I've not heard that that's happening. And I'm not sure I would want to be part of that either. Um, so I think they're still selling the shoes. But what that does is that opens up many more value-adding <laughs> subscription revenues. And that's <laughs> things that are helping the user of the product. Um, not just, uh, and, and ultimately people are willing to, to pay more and consume more for that. So as a quick whistle stops tour through, I think a lot of when people are, when companies are thinking of commercializing data, some of the things they need to think about and, and why I think the product role is important in that. So I think that's actually going to become more important over the next few years. So the reason is building new business models, as we've seen, is really important to that. So, so if I'm thinking of commercializing my data, do I need a whole new business or do I need a new activity and how do I do that? And what's the value I can actually drive from that rather than just charging for the output? The ability to focus on how I make that scalable and repeatable. So this is a very much underappreciated, in my observations from all the companies I've come into contact with, this is frequently underappreciated um, activity in, uh, in, 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 in commercializing your data. And then I think there is, especially as you move towards machine learning and AI, there is the right balance of, of, of low friction with not being a black box and the ability to configure. So if I think about, we talk about Fitbit, you buy a Fitbit, you take it out of the box, you do two taps on an app, you plug it on your wrist and you walk and it works. And then you can, but you can configure it endlessly. So you can change the threshold on which it buzzes on your, uh, on your wrist each day to from 10,000 steps to 20,000 or 1,000, or you could even change what it 
buzzes on. So does it care more about calories? Does it care more about um, minutes of uh, minutes in cardiac zone? So you, you can configure it endlessly, but you don't have to. This is not a big setup job. You don't buy it and then embark upon a long manual reading exercise of the sort that we used to do when we bought electronic devices. So I guess the thing is to go and find the most data savvy product people um, in the companies you're in around and about and start to partner with those and start bringing together that thinking. So that was, um, that was my, uh, my, my little talk on that. But there's a few more things I just wanted to run through about us. So it being a software engineering uh, conference, I wanted to talk about just a little bit briefly about things to check out. So go check out our online.worldpay.com. So this is uh, payment APIs. It's very developer focused. And the feedback I've had is it's very developer friendly. It's something we also use internally for our own innovations as well. So we have a lot of experience in using that. And then we talked about the Internet of Things. And uh, so we've got um, Connor sitting here, was one of the folks uh, leading this. Um, we're thinking ahead on connected devices into actually what's the role of payments within those. So that's going to become something that's really, really important as this takes off a lot more. So, so actually, how do you do payments within the inter Internet of Things? So three weeks ago today, there's a bunch of people appeared in New Zealand House. And we, um, uh, we, we set challenges. And uh, it was actually uh, really well attended. And so people got, they got lots of Lego. They got lots of Raspberry Pis. They brought their genius and their skills. And then they set to work on creating stuff. And uh, this, at one point, was the highest trending uh, hashtag in London. Am I right? And it beat the West Ham game? So maybe Russell Brand wasn't there that day, <laughs> but uh, that was a uh, that was a pretty big achievement. The team was really proud of, and uh, and as an idea, the the winner. So I, I don't know if he won on his Lego building skills, but um, but the uh, the the winner was a guy who created a whole way of doing payments for my renewable energy sources that I put in my solar panel, my wind panel on my house, so that I can understand the load balancing of generation and usage, and st and actually think about programmatic payments to and from. So, uh, so some really cool stuff that was actually working created off that. And then uh, one final point. So you probably walked past it on the way in, but please visit our stand y if you haven't already. And if you haven't already, then enter the prize draw to hopefully win a drone. And uh, Hardeep is trying to get the bottle of wine. So speak to Hardeep, and she promises not to drone on. <coughs> so anyway, um, that was everything that I had to talk about. I've tried to speed it up to uh, catch time back so that people don't lose their break. Thank you very much for uh, for coming, and uh, <laughs> pleasure to talk to you.